What's up, H-Town? Welcome to the Believe in Astros podcast, your home for all things Astros, with your hosts, sports writer Jeff Balky and Astros broadcaster and former third baseman Jeff Blob. Now, here's Balky and Blubber. What's up, H-Town? Welcome to episode 14 of the Believe in Astros podcast on the Believe Podcasting Network. I'm Jeff Balky, as always, with uh, my partner in crime, Jeff Blum. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, all of the usual places, as well as YouTube, where you can see both of our extensive collections of bobbleheads um, behind us. And in my case, I have one on the shelf that a friend of mine is convinced looks like Ronald Reagan, but it's not. It's Rudy <laughs> Tomjanovich. And uh, I'm not sure Rudy T would be real thrilled with that comparison, but you know, we'll let it go for now. So, uh, Blummer, how are you doing? How's the week been? Uh, you're back at home now. Uh, how are things? Uh, things are good. They're always good when I'm back here recording in H Town, and I've got my friends behind me hanging out. That's always a nice thing. But uh, it was a little interesting being in Anaheim and trying to broadcast a game in shorts, which I've never done until then. But uh, <laughs> It, it was that hot out there, and I've never been more grateful to be back into, you know, 85 and some mild humidity. Man, it was that rough. I know uh, I know that uh, you said you brought, like, a, a little device with you to help keep you cool. Did it even ma- make any difference at all, or was it just too sweltering? It, it was sweltering, and, and Anaheim is one of those places where, you know, the, the, the Press box is kind of modified because I don't know if any of you remember back in the day, it actually used to be a fully enclosed stadium. The Rams played there when they were the quote unquote Los Angeles Rams. So it makes sense that we're playing against the quote unquote Los Angeles Angels, but (laughs) they tore down the, the outfields bleachers. They moved the press boxes behind home plate. There are, you know, they're, they're remade, but they're not on the concourse. So you don't get any of the concourse airflow up there. You're just in a stagnant, concrete box and it just absorbs all the heat god no movement but yeah i had a fan that was maybe the size of maybe the width of a baseball and it was just (laughs) rushing some hot air up my nostrils so that was about all i had (laughs) that is that sounds awful i'm not gonna lie to you that sounds absolutely i i did a gig years ago uh when i was still a professional musician at a at a place in corpus christi called cole park and it was in the middle of summer and Cole Park has this amphitheater that's just like a big concrete spit and you just and the sun is setting right in your face and i remember at the end of it i looked back on my amp and i there were 16 bottles of water that i had gone through for oh, in 2 hours and my and i remember thinking that i had sweated even through my jeans <laughs> like even my jeans were sweating. it's just too super much super sexy yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, and then of course we I was 25 or 26 when so we immediately left there, ate a bunch of Mexican food and then played for 3 more hours at some bar. <laughs> Nowadays, I would literally have been dead in 30 minutes. I wouldn't have made it. Oh, yeah. There's just no chance. I don't care. There's not enough uh, pickup basketball games in the world I can play to survive that one. So I feel for you, man. I'm glad you're back in Houston. And Houston has some pleasant weather right now. I can't really I turn and look out my window and it's it's not actually too bad. No, Certainly better it, than it, 106 or whatever that was. Well, that's what everybody discounts. You're out there in California. Oh, the weather's perfect. And there are pockets where, you know, overall on throughout the course of a year, it could be 72 degrees right. you know, uh, consistently. But there's a th- right. September and October, are the worst months out there. And September and October, I have found obviously here in Houston are phenomenal. The heat starts to subside. You can actually sit right. outside, have a nice little beverage and enjoy some chat, you know, with your wife. And oh, my right. gosh. And then, of course, postseason baseball. Well, that's a bit, I, I've always contended that October 1st is the greatest single day of the year because, number one, it's really basically the beginning of fall for Houston. We don't really get a, a decent cold front until the first week or so of October. It is the beginning of the real baseball season. Basketball season is almost underway. It's the NBA. Is the, if you're a hockey fan, there's that football season going. Like All the sports are happening all at once. It's starting to cool down. It's basically the end of hurricane season for Texas which really ends like the last week in September. And it's the beginning of the holidays. Like we, I have people in my neighborhood right now who already have Halloween decorations up and I am not hating on them <laughs> at all. I'm like, cool, let's do this. It's, it's September the what? 7th. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm ready 
Yeah. Put up that creepy blow up thing with the weird <laughs> vampire inside of it. I'm down. Yeah, can <laughs> can we give the respect to the holidays though, by the way? Because oh. you talking about that. Last time I was in town, wife and I make our Costco run because I've got 15 kids yep. and we buy in bulk everywhere. <laughs> and there's Christmas trees already up. Can we give Halloween the respect? Can we give right. Thanksgiving the respect before we get into Christmas? I'm right. with you on that. Well, and you know it's, and by the way, you know Halloween is coming because there are costume shops in strip malls that pop up all over the, the land. I believe it. I mean, it's, there's a party city on every corner uh, starting uh, about September 1st. And one thing I've learned about Houston, too, is that the fireworks are borderline insane but every fireworks shop turns into that spirit halloween shop that turns you know right it's just seasonal it's beautiful let let me tell you something there you do not want to be outside (laughs) at new on new year's eve at midnight in houston because you might look you might catch a a a bottle rocket you might catch a stray bullet we don't know (laughs) all we know is your safest bet is to be inside right i know everybody i remember there was a guy that lived across the street from you growing up and every New Year's Eve, he would come out at midnight in his underwear with his shotgun and fire it in the air and go back inside every year. Just one single shot. Just one shot. That was it. He just oh. wanted to let everybody know he's it's New Year's. Happy New Year, everybody. Is there Here's my shotgun. More Texas? <laughs> it's, I don't know. Unless he was wow. wearing a cowboy hat. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about some Astros. I, I, last night was interesting. You know, they. Um, Kind of a tough loss because, you know, uh, Framber Aldez gets his 23rd consecutive quality start, mainly because of all the errors. I mean, three errors oh. on the Astros, which was, it's kind of shocking. You just don't really see that sort of thing from them all on the infield. Uh, we did, I did notice, of course, and tweeted out that uh, Bregman broke his streak of 44 games. Who owns the number one streak on that spot in the Astros <laughs> history? Ladies and gentlemen, it's Jeff Lum. At, I think 68, is it? Something like that? 67, it's, 68 I think games? it was at 65, but it, it, the best part about this <laughs> is that our production truck, and you know, I marvel at what these guys do, because to your point, when Framber Valdez is on the mound, you will see Dusty Baker consistently put out his best defensive infield because you've got right. Bregman, Pena, Altuve, Yuli. Ground balls. And ground ball central and as an as a defender i loved playing behind those guys because you knew there was going to be contact you knew you could anticipate the ground ball and make the play for those guys so you were a little more in rhythm with what the pitcher was doing but last night was insane i've never there's probably you would have to do some serious digging to find out when you actually yeah. had an altuve bregman yuli error game that's what's right. even more rare to me and uh to see you know alex bregman has now has two 44 game airless streak so to credit to him i mean you, right one game in between 88 is pretty damn impressive yeah but uh yeah our production truck does a good job of digging on these stats and when they find yeah. stuff like that they won't tell me until it's on the screen i was <laughs> really? like really i'm trying to talk to alex going man this guy's awesome this guy's great wait a minute i know that that's my name you know that was kind of funny so that was I took pretty a lot good of pride in defense yeah, I absolutely. Hits, but I tried to take as many away as I could. <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I, I don't know about that. Let's not. You, you did have, you did have decent career numbers at the plate. Let's not, let's not diss on Jeff Blum by Jeff Blum. Let's, let's try to keep it civil. <laughs> but I, I will say that uh, the error situation is really odd because the Astros, you know, statistically have one of the best defenses in all of baseball. It's not really even a question. Even with all the moving parts they've had, I mean, obviously on the infield, they've been pretty injury-free for most of the year with Jeremy Pena's uh, going out for a little bit being the one exception. But even in the outfield, they've really been good defensively. And so to have that in a game was really seemed like an aberration to me. And quite frankly, they don't get those errors. It's a totally different game. The Astros probably win that ball game. And uh, and I'm actually glad for Fromber. I mean, he didn't pitch great last night, um, <clears throat> but he still had double digit strikeouts. And really, if not for those those errors, you know, this it was a different ball game. They probably end up with the win, and and then going into tonight looking for a sweep against the. Uh, I've been calling them the Plano Rangers, but I was thinking <laughs> South Lake they, Rangers. They probably appreciate and... <laughs> that, but more than my South Oklahoma claim. That's that's not bad. The South Oklahoma <laughs> Rangers is pretty good, but I mean, with a with a, do you, do you just when you get air a game like that, as a baseball player, do you just kind of like go, okay, that that game sucked. 
let's just move on. Try to. I mean, I know with 180, 162 games, you've obviously got to. As as I heard one person say one time, you not only have to have a good memory, you have to have a good forgettery. Um, is that something that you really have to just kind of like move on and, and get past it, knowing that you already had 44 games in a row without an error? Yeah, no, they, these guys, they're true professionals and they literally wake up day to day. And you're right about having, the, you remember the good stuff, you lock that in, the muscle memory from a great swing, the, the movement mm. or the anticipation on a pitch that was at contact and you made a good jump on it to make a good play. Those are the things you remember. And right. also in baseball, you were there's so much negativity and failure in the game that when you do something right, you hold on to that as long as you possibly can. And when you don't right. do something right, you work to correct it and not do it again. And that's one thing yeah. I think these Astros are phenomenally good at is is having the mentality, like you said, a forgettery, short-term memory, whatever you, want to, yeah. whatever you want to call it. These guys have the ability. We've seen it with games where they've blown up. Uh, made the three errors, uh, given up 15 hits, lost nine to two, and all of a sudden the next day they come back, they score seven runs, and it's a shutout. Right. And they play phenomenal defense. The, uh, this is probably one of the better teams at turning the page and moving on. And I think these guys will have no problem doing that. But I think that more, you know, more often than not, you know, I said it last night with Bregman after he made that error. There's nobody on the field that is begging for a baseball. To be <laughs> yeah, at him. I heard you say more that. Than, I thought it, that's more than funny. Alex Bregman. <laughs> and that's that's the mentality that I love yeah. about these guys. They're like, damn it, I, I screwed that up. But hey, tell you what, hit the next one to me, and I'll pick you up, and we'll move on. But these guys will be fine. I think they're just they're they're more grateful that Fromber got the consecutive quality start yeah. streak still going, but they're also disappointed they let him down and didn't get him that W. Right, no doubt. Well, speaking of pitchers, we have to talk about Hunter Brown. Ooh, you know, we were having I was having this discussion with a couple of friends of mine. And we were trying to remember the last time an Astros, like a rookie, not somebody they traded for. I mean, I can remember when Randy Johnson came in and immediately everybody was like, holy crap. But uh, a, a rookie that came up and just immediately dominated in their first appearance on the mound. I mean, that was an, a really, uh, to use your term, much impressed uh, performance. <laughs> and... Uh, I just, I mean, I know you and I texted about it saying that you thought his control could have been better. And my, it's funny you say that my father-in-law, who's just an incredibly avid baseball fan for many, many, many decades now, um, he was saying, yeah, he thought he grooved a bunch of pitches in there, a bunch of fastballs that those guys just didn't get, right? Yep. Against a pretty good Rangers uh, lineup. Um, what were your first impressions of, of watching Hunter Brown and, and, you know, how do you think that's going to translate going forward? I, I think that he's going to create an issue, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that for a little bit later. I'll just tease yeah. that. He's going to create an issue because he's so good. Yeah. But the fact, like you said, you know, another rookie that came up and, and had the, the expectation or had that prospect status, yeah. or had that electricity around him. The only right. other guy you, maybe you could compare him to is Lance McCullers, but he had a good right. first outing. It wasn't right. until that third, fourth start where he had right, a exactly. game and you went, you went, damn, this guy, dude, that curveball, I've never seen anything like that. I know. And, that know, was the, the thing that was so numbers, crazy. Yeah. And and he started to wipe guys out. And you're going, damn, this guy is going to have an impact for a long time. Yeah. But Hunter Brown kind of came up with that, you know, I don't know. It's not new school, but he's definitely got that 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 modern day pitcher vibe about him where he's a monster. He's six foot four. He, right. He's got the broad shoulders. He's got that in that look already. But then all of a sudden he went first pitch fastball and you were like, okay, there's life on that. Mm -hmm. The one that jumped at me and I turned to TK and I and it went it came in and it just went whap. And I was like, wait a minute. I heard that through my headset and I'm I'm 350 feet away from this guy. The pop in the glove is what excited me. He, and he went through the zone. He wasn't pitching to the target. Right. He was throwing it through the catcher, and that's what impressed me. And, you know, to your dad's point, I think we both kind of were like, ooh, that pitch was right down the middle, and they just missed it because he's throwing 98. Mm -hmm. If he could refine that, and I'm, this yeah. is just getting out on that, you know, getting out on that uh, limb where you're saying, if I could nitpick just a little bit, it'd be yeah. fastball in the upper part of the zone, dot the inside, outside, make the hitter move his eyes and his hands a little bit. Yeah. But when... You're throwing 98, you can get away with it. But he'll learn how to do that. The secondary pitches, you know, the story about his curveball not showing up until he's in uniform with the Astros blew my mind. Wow. But then I about fell out of my chair when the first slider came in at 96. I was like, that okay. was, 
I mean, is it even a that, slider at that point? I mean, that was I don't ridiculous. Know. It's more of a cutter, but it right. moved as much as a slider. And the issue I was talking about before I started, uh, you know, going off on Hunter Brown mm-hmm. is he's a weapon. You know, yeah. what do you do with this? You've all of a sudden you've got the, you know, you've got another weapon in your arsenal where you're going. Yeah. How do I fit this guy in? Because he will be effective late in the season and he yeah. will be effective in the postseason if they choose to put him on the playoff roster yeah I, that's and and we'll get into that a little bit here um i saw i saw a tweet from somebody that i thought was really funny where they said how is it that every year the minor league uh, evaluations are like the houston astros farm system contains not one single person yeah. who's ever seen a baseball before and then they debut one to three kick-ass players before the season ends and I'm telling you, it's just true. They, every year, people are like, "Well, they've got you know they they don't have a very good farm team," and they're you know, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, by the way, we do have this guy who's probably going to come up and hit about 350 in his first 20 games and with like 10 home runs." Or we've got this pitcher, by the way, that throws 98 and a 96 mile an hour slider. So yeah, our farm yeah. system's not very good. <laughs> other well, than that, when, yeah, even when Tucker comes up, you're going okay, high prospect, but the rest of the organization's right. terrible. Oh. Jordan showed up a year later and you're going, good Lord, this guy's an MVP candidate and wins rookie of the year. And like you yeah. said, I believe it was this year, there were a couple publications that had the Astros at 28-29. Right. And you've got Yainer Diaz who's coming up. You've got, uh, you know, David Hensley who's come out of nowhere right. and just hitting rockets all over the place. And right. oh, by the way, their number one prospect has an absolute hand cannon. So, I mean, <laughs> how do you find these guys and how do you develop them? They're doing a well, phenomenal job. You know, and like, what is it? I just saw yesterday that Corey Lee has had ten home, has had like seven <laughs> home runs yeah, in his last ten him. games at Triple yep. A. I mean, they, really, they and and that's because in count Pedro Leon, who's been ridiculous oh. this year down there as well. So you yeah. just got, uh, you know, I think it's one of those things where uh, they have a lot of, you know, maybe they don't have a lot of, you know, breadth of talent. Maybe their talent level is pretty shallow on the whole. But who cares if your best talent is incredible? Because ultimately, look, if you have solid talent across the board in your minor league system, the vast majority of that's never going to make the majors anyway. Oftentimes, the main thing that they are used for is pieces and trade moves and things like that. So your main objective is to develop high-quality major league baseball players. And and that's what the Estras are doing. Well, and to to your point, would you rather have the highest rated farm system i know the dodgers do and they play successfully yeah. but there's a there's a dozen other teams that have high prospect but they right. don't produce at the big league level what the astros have been able to do is have whatever low farm ratings but high production in the in the major leagues and that's why right. they have been able to be you know on the on the edge of getting to another ALCS and having this winning tenure of 6 7 years in a row because they're able to develop and you know that's through the draft through trade uh, through free agency through waiver but the one right. thing that I think that doesn't get talked about enough and something I try to harp on when we have the opportunity to talk about it mm-hmm. is the international signings by the Astros oh yeah the doors off everybody else oh yeah no that's the other thing too I mean they were really the first ball club to have like a, a yes. camp in Venezuela um, you know they have they the were Dominican one of the very first over. organizations to really really yep. embrace the signings of international players and uh, it's paid off for them. I mean, it's completely paid off for them. Th- th- just thinking about it this year, you mentioned Hensley, obviously. Corey Lee has been up. Uh, Diaz is up. Hunter Brown is up. Mm-hmm. And lest we forget, this is Jeremy Pena's rookie season. Oh, I mean, damn, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jeremy Pena came up and everybody just a was... guy now. <laughs> exactly. He's just like, well, you know, it's Jeremy Pena, whatever. He's he's a veteran at this point. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is really remarkable now we say all this but the Astros have not been very good offensively lately mm-hmm. and I was just looking at some of their numbers for the year uh pulled up some uh stuff from baseball perspectives and and prospectus and stat heads and a few others interestingly enough they have some sort of deceptive stats in there that I found they're 13th in batting average 11th in on base 7th mm-hmm. in slugging and OPS which tells you that well, you know, it's not as bad as you know, as we as we both know, batting average is not as much a big deal anymore. You don't see that, and they're also again twenty. They're they're like 
a 28th or I guess you would say t- second in strikeouts. So they don't strike out very much. Yeah. They're eighth in walks. So they, they walk a ton and fifth in homers, which is of course where a lot of their run production is coming from. But also I thought a couple of advanced stats were pretty interesting. They're second in zone contact. They're second in first pitch swings, which means they're aggressive at the plate, obviously, and they're all, and they're third in their whiff percentage. So they very rarely swing and miss at pitches. This is a team that obviously is very judicious in their choices when it comes to hitting, but they just don't score a ton of runs. I haven't looked at their uh, risk numbers in terms of runners in scoring position. It hasn't been good, I'm sure especially towards the bottom of the lineup. But like, what have you seen out of their offense that keeps them from producing runs, but seems, but nevertheless, they're still pretty good at getting a, a bat on a baseball. No, I think those two things, the OPS numbers is obviously something that they harp on. That's, that's an analytic, you know, number that the Astros have really kind of done a very good job at. They want to be on base as often as they possibly can. And yeah. they want to hit the baseball extremely hard. And unfortunately, when you rely mm-hmm. on those two things, it, it will lead to maybe a lack of production in the sense that you're not getting those hit, runs with or those hits with runners in scoring position, but at the same time, their their record with two plus home runs in in a game is is borderline I think 750. So they're winning three quarters <laughs> of the games that they go out there and hit hit two home runs in. So they do rely on the slug quite a bit, yeah. but I don't think that. I don't think that's something to fear moving into the postseason just because mm. of experience. And if you're going on past uh, production and looking at projections, you figure this team who is high contact, like you're talking about, in yeah. the zone, they're going to force <clears throat> a lot of pitchers to get in the zone by taking a lot of pitches. Therefore, you're on base a lot. But putting the ball in play puts a lot of pressure on the defense. They're going to get some you know, some cheap runs. They're going to drive runners in with uh, less than two outs and guy at third base, which leads to big runs in uh, tight ball games. Yeah. And – What's really point. kind of masked that idea of scoring limited runs is the pitching staff. They have the best pitching well, yeah. staff in the American <clears throat> League, and thankfully they've been able to mask that. But Jordan gets going, this offense is going to get going and put up some big runs. Yeah, you, you've been saying pretty consistently you think Jordan is, is getting close to being back to that point where and you think towards the end of this, as September going into October, you're, we're going to see a different Jordan, right? Yeah, just I got down on the field, watched him take a little bit of batting practice, and you know, obviously we don't know why he was out. There was something with the hand. We don't know which mm-hmm. hand or what the problem was. Whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, the X fi- the uh, the X files of uh, of injury reports. Yeah, it was some form of discomfort. We do know yeah, that. We do know it's it's always some form of discomfort. We do know that. Yeah. But uh, watching him take batting practice, there's there's certain actions in a guy's swing where you can see the bat path and you go, okay, that guy's getting through the zone nicely. Alex Bregman and Kyle Tucker are two guys that are easy to watch because if you see Alex Bregman's hands coming across his chest and really extending and finishing mm-hmm. towards the pitcher, he's in a good spot. Kyle Tucker's the same way. If that bat lays down and gets in the zone early and he's able to extend through the pitcher, so to mm-hmm. speak, really trying to get the hands towards him, he's in a good spot and he's seeing the bat well. But Jordan Alvarez, for me, was kind of in and out of the zone. And I think the reason he was in and out of the zone was trying to protect those hands and trying to protect that injury a little bit. But what I saw in batting practice yesterday, he was starting to elevate and launch to center field. And you're starting to see that backspin and that ball kind of rise and take off a little bit. And it's just a matter of time. Once he gets that feeling right and understands that he's healthy, then -hmm. it gets back to timing. And once the timing's good, then you can make better swing decisions. Because I think right now there's a little bit of panic and and urgency in that swing where he's chasing some pitches out of the zone that we're not accustomed to. But I think the more at-bats he gets, the more he's going to dial that in. And good Lord, if he gets healthy and gets right, watch out. Yeah, and and you do, and you mentioned it. I mean, we we say all this. This is so nitpicky because the Astros still have the second best record in baseball, and um, they're likely to win the American League, uh, you know, outright in terms of record. And it's Man, yeah. and but as you said, it it's pitching. I mean, these they're the starting pitchers are second in baseball, in second in the AL in ERA, and their bullpen is first in all of baseball in ERA, which is just. And you you haven't even added Christian Javier to that bullpen, which is likely to happen when the playoffs come around. Never mind whatever is going to go on with Hunter Brown, um, which as you Chris said, is a still cannon, on the injured list. 
a can in hand. And yes, Presley's on the injury list. Verlander's not pitching right now. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's an embarrassment of riches, right? But which brings yeah. me to Luis Garcia. Like, Garcia's a really interesting study here because you've got a guy who uh, has pitched well throughout the season, then has gone through this slump. Then he has a really good game recently, so you got to wonder. And and he's not a guy that's ever come out of the bullpen before, so I would assume the Astros are going to be hesitant to bring him out of the bullpen. But does he even really have a place as a starter? So, how can you leave that guy off the playoff roster? But also, how do you take him? It's a very, it's a kind of a weird situation with him right now. Well, I mean, you just said it. The you know the embarrassment of riches, and yeah. that's where the decisions get tough. And you know that. As a, as a general manager, as a manager, as a pitching coach, if you're, you know, you're taking Dusty Baker, James Click, Josh Miller, and you put them in a room and you're like, okay, we need to form, formulate a bullpen. We need to formulate a rotation. Right. Uh, the division series, I believe, is still at five games. So you're going to have That's a right. shorter rotation. Can you bolster, you know, is this guy going to bolster your bullpen? Is he going to make you that much better? And I think that's where the yeah. question comes in. And, if we get Luis Garcia from that uh, ALCS game against the Boston Red yeah. Sox, where he was throwing 96-97 with a wipeout cutter, right. if you get the guy that pitched, like you said, in that last outing where he was just a tad little bit angry and, and put away an Angels team, then you're going, okay, that guy plays, but I think the inconsistency might pop into their head. And again, yeah. these are these are just nitpicking. This is, yeah, this is they the really are gritty because if you get Ryan <clears throat> Presley back, He's your closer. That pushes Montero, Naris, Stanek, right. Mayton, Abreu, <laughs> everybody back. <laughs> and Abreu all of a sudden is a yeah. dude. I mean, you start pushing these guys back, and you're going, well, how do I even get this guy in the into the game? Right. Is it a blowout? Is it a piggyback right. behind uh, Urquidy? And then yeah. Javier moves into the bullpen. Where where do these guys? Pe- you know, where do these pieces fit in? And I think you're going to have to start looking at if Verlander gets back. Obviously, Ver- Verlander, Fromber, Lance, uh, right. Hunter Brown moves in. These names, I mean, they they just keep getting deeper and better. But you also have to look at matchup too. In that first round, who who is it going to be that they're yeah. matching up against? And does Luis Garcia match up better against those guys? And that's the question you've got to ask. Another one too. You bring this up and you said it. You said Verlander, Fromber, Lance. Is that really the reality, or is it Verlander, Fromber? Jose Urquidy. I mean, it is very difficult to argue that Jose Urquidy is their third best starter. Uh, no. may, you know, and so you kind of, I mean, I know Lance has been great in the playoffs and hopefully he turns it around and becomes even better, but he's also pitched short on short rest in bullpen mm-hmm. situations. These are a lot of questions that obviously are going to come up because the playoff rosters are not far off and we're a month off, mm-hmm. you know, from that. Even though, even though the World Series, if it goes to a Game Seven, doesn't end until like slightly before Christmas. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, come on, it's so unbelievable. Like we're going to be playing yeah. baseball in the first, like late in the first week of November, likely. Yeah, I mean, and uh, no, God it, help it's insane you. to think about. But that, but I think that's and the way the schedule is set up too, with that, mm-hmm. you know some of these lack of days off that we're accustomed to seeing in past yeah. postseason. Uh, series I think that's where the Astros kind of step up a little bit and I think that's why everybody's concerned about the pitching staff because if you don't have those days off to set up your rotation and give your yeah, bullpen some right. rest you need depth and we know that the Astros have plenty of depth and to your point about Jose Urquidy again it goes back to matchups you yeah. know and this is this is the beauty of sitting where we're sitting is because we yeah. can speculate and have some fun and be that <laughs> right totally GM. And say, oh my gosh, what if you know if Verkiti's pitching as well? Man, we could actually slot him in front of this guy or that guy. But you know, maybe Lance moves into a bullpen situation where he can go two innings and spin the living hell out of somebody yeah. and have him not touch him. That's yeah. where I think the benefit of Lance is. But at the same time, I want to see Lance. I want to see Lance pitch and start these games because I know yeah. it's in there. And I, you got to remember, these are still early April games for him in his mind and his arm. He is right. still building up strength, and he's still <clears throat> building up that release point and that delivery. And who's to say his last two or three starts, all of a sudden we see that sinker whap come in at 92 yep. to 94 
tie up some right-handed hitters and then just spin everybody to, you know, to death. And he gets that release point and all of a sudden he's dialed in and then we're going, all right, what do we do with Javier, <laughs> Lance McCullers or Keedy, Luis Garcia, Hunter Brown? That's five dudes that yeah. could be a rotation two years from now. Oh no, it's, it's just, it's completely ridiculous. And, and obvi- I, nobody wants Lance McCullers to succeed more than I do. I feel like Lance is the, and we've talked about it on here. I really do think he is the sort of, sort of fiery heart of the of the organization. I, I, I'm you with know, you. I think he's that he's that little bit of an edge and wild card yeah. that might, you know, will play a big part in the playoffs, I think. Yeah, and also by the way, shout out to his charity that that rescues yes. animals. It's just an incredible organization that saves a lot of animals. Um, something that's near and dear personally to my heart as well. So we got a soft schedule coming up. I was looking at it. I always I hate saying it. I don't even like mentioning it really. I feel like saying it is almost a jinx. It's like talking about a no hitter in the fifth inning. Um, I but when you look at it, after the Rangers, it's the Angels, then the Tigers, then the A's. The next like series against a really good team is Tampa Bay. Um, I mean. <laughs> At this point, too, the Astros don't have to really do that much to be. I mean, they're certainly going to win the division at this point. There's, you know, we've already knocked out three of the division teams um, this this early. I think I saw their magic number to clinch the division was something like six fifteen or something like that. I think, and I then think they're it's down to fifteen today. Yes. Yeah, and then I think I think eleven for the playoffs. So mm-hmm. just to clinch the playoffs. So they don't have to do a ton. Look, in this next series of games leading up to the race, they could accomplish most of that, right? So yep. how do you approach games like this when you're playing a bunch of, uh, you know, little sisters of the poor, as, uh, as I've heard the, <laughs> I described before? I can't remember which announcer I heard say that once, but I always thought that was pretty good. How do you, uh, how do you like, uh, address this as a team, you know, as a player? How do you go? Do you just go into these and be like, all right, to hell, like, I always feel like it's like doing it's kind of like doing chores. You don't want to do them, but it's like let's just attack these, get them out of the way, and then you know we could lounge around and do whatever we want. How do they how do they approach that sort of thing? Well, I mean, you're getting paid a little bit better for these chores, so <laughs> you know that's that's probably the Fair. best part about it. But at the same time, you know you can't. Let's just go ahead. You know, we we said that we were you know the the armchair GM. Let's go ahead and be an yeah. armchair manager right now and envision yeah. we're in that clubhouse as Dusty Baker, and you've got this. You know, you've got this Ferrari idling at the red light, waiting to see what happens next. Instead of being cautious through that green light, you got to motor through it. But yeah. how do you motivate these guys? And you can't just show up and kind of look at the clubhouse and say, "All right, boys, let's beat the pants off this team that sucks." You know, you got to go in there and find each individual and find a way to motivate them. Is it Alex Bregman getting to 25 home runs and 100 RBI? Say, Alex, you've got mm-hmm. some. You've got some serious uh, numbers that you could work towards to, you know, extend your legacy and really cap yeah. off a great year that you really fought back in. Kyle Tucker, you're playing for an extension. You're playing for arbitration. You have a chance to be 25 and 25 as far as home runs and stolen That's bases. That's incredible. Uh, you're Don. You get 100 RBIs, man. Let's bounce back and show these guys what you can do. You got to go to these guys individually and find a way to motivate them and encourage them to say, yes, we are a postseason team, but at the same time. That's off in the distance. We're going to get there. How about focus on what you're able to go out and do right now against some guys that are maybe subpar, get that confidence up, get those numbers, boost that ego a little bit, puff that chest out, and let's go roll into the postseason going, damn, I achieved my goals there. Now I want to achieve my goals here because the regular season now is individual. The postseason yeah. is when you galvanize as a team and sacrifice everything you have to get into the postseason and win. And I think that's where you can kind of individualize it now and then look at the team aspect later on. Yeah, that's a good point. I remember Kenny Smith, uh, former Rockets point guard, always saying you know, that he had heard it from uh, somebody that he had played with, is that in the regular season you make your name and in the postseason you make your fame. And uh, I feel I like – it's yeah, it's and it's it seems totally true. You know, these are guys that if you want it, but if you're gonna if you want to get there, you've got to do the work. Um, I was you know I was thinking about one guy that that obviously that was never a problem for was Jeff Bagwell. Mm-hmm. He was obviously someone that was inner motivated, and I'm wondering how you how, what you think about him call uh, uh, on the broadcast. I listened to a little bit of the radio broadcast with him and Robert mm-hmm. Ford. I find Baggy just to be so like just genuinely fun to listen to because he's so deadpan 
and so like <laughs> and just so like yeah I'm going to thing hit at the ball is fine he just needs to it was somebody asked him what can you tell a kid who's learning how to play baseball he says tell him to have fun hit the ball when it when it's pitched in the zone and uh throw strikes <laughs> Yeah, keep Perfect. it simple, stupid. Right? Yeah, keep I mean, it it's simple. Just a kiss idea. I just, I wonder what you think about Bagwell d- doing some broadcasting because he's obviously, you know, this is obviously fun for him and and it's interesting for yeah. fans. But he's he's a he's a an interesting guy to listen to, really. Very well, different from your knowledge. normal announcer. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a wealth of knowledge to begin with, and you know, I learned a lot just being around him. Yeah, and he was, you know, he was he was vocal, but not in the sense that he is now. He was just a little more. Uh, you know, it was more in the sense of the season. It was a little more, uh, it, it wasn't diplomatic. You know, now he's more mm. diplomatic. In, in the clubhouse, it would be a little more direct and it would be a little more, it was easier to understand because now I think he's trying to learn how to explain that to right. fans. And I think part of his appeal is, you know, and this is something I kind of shy away from, just, and it's just, it's personal style. It's, yeah. It's my idea of broadcasting, but Jeff is an Astro. He he was he got traded over. Yeah, played his entire career as an Astro. He's a liaison. He's an ambassador. He's a broadcaster. Right. He is he is Mister Astro. So he, when he gets on, I think fans love the fact that he's like we us together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's got this mentality. Whereas I had my time, and <laughs> as much as I feel as I'm an Astro, this is their time, and I want to give them all the glory and all the praise and 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 just heap everything on them and let them enjoy it. And yeah. I just want to be an innocent bystander that gets to put my voice on it and 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 just marvel at their accolades and their abilities. Right. But I think that's I think, good. Yeah, thank you. And it, yeah, you I know, think that's, that's good. Where, I think that's the way it should be. Really, I mean, I love the Astro thing. You're right, but there is something to be said for that. A little bit of detachment from that because then you can speak your mind and it's and you can be honest. And I think people trust that source of information if you're honest about it. I appreciate that. And I, I like the idea of developing that trust. And obviously my, my relationship with the fan base in Houston is, is far exceeded any of my expectations because I think we're, <laughs> I think my relationship with the fans is we're in this fight together against right. everybody else in the big leagues. That's right. Uh, fan bases. And so we've kind of taken up that torch together, but baggy is so good and the knowledge yeah. is so good. And you know, that's just, he's not, how about the fact that he achieved the ultimate goal of of being coming a Hall of Famer? But when you hear him talk, he he's not monotone, but he's very flatlined. He really he's is. He's not going to have too many peaks. He's not going to have too many valleys. And I think that's where he appeals, and where you kind of understand how great he was able to be because he knew he was good, but yeah. didn't really you know it was kind of humbling to him to be that good. But at the same time, the right. game humbled him so often that he really respects the game. And that really comes through in how he broadcasts. And, and my relationship with him is phenomenal. And That's I know it awesome. comes through on the broadcast. <laughs> totally. And I love having him on. Totally. I just think he's a good guy to have on occasionally. Like, he doesn't strike me as a guy that would even want to do like this all the time. This like doesn't feel like his, yeah, his here, here's whole a secret thing. on this Believe podcast. I don't think he'd want to do 150 games either. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, <laughs> look. It's it's hard out there for a pimp. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's a, it's a 150 games is a lot is a lot. So, all right, one last thing. It's been going around Twitter, so I've been dying to ask. There's a there's been a whole thing about uh, what like your walk up music was, uh, what you what you would have if you had your own walk up music. I've actually put a lot of thought into my own. I've been playing music since I was a teenager, so I'm I love it. I'm yeah, so, you've got but I first. First of all, what was yours, and would you change it now? I would not change it now. I, I So I went through kind of a metamorphosis until I, I, I heard of a band named Chevelle. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, it, amazingly enough, they're from Chicago, no connection. But uh, I came out to the song The Red, and I just mm-hmm. liked the, the first lyric that came out of there was, you know, uh, they call you freak when you when you're by yourself, kind of thing, and that's how I always felt in the box. You're you know, there's this one man on an island competing against another guy on an island, and everybody's eyes were on you. So that's where I kind of got that thing. Uh, nice. You know, they say freak when you're uh, by yourself, but it, it, there was a there was a moment in time when I got my first arbitration check, and I came up to uh, Alien Ant Farms, Smooth Criminal. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Oh my god, that is that is strong. That is absolutely super strong. 
I like the freak line. That's good. My my wife has said uh, she said something about me years ago, and I thought it was so perfectly apt for me. She says I'm a uh, I'm a freak among normals and a normal among freaks, and I was like, that is a perfect description. I like so it. I I like that in the box. I've already decided that I probably would walk up to uh, Prodigy's Diesel Power, um, oh. mainly because it's got this it's got this heavy groove. It's like really just a thick groove. But the, here's the thing for me though, I would it want it taken really good in stadium speakers. By the way, right? Like it's like bassy. Mm, oh, yeah. it's just like really good. But the thing mm. is, I would want just a little bit more because that's the the type of person I am. So what I would want is I would want somehow for it to be broadcast in slow motion, and then also <laughs> I would want as I'm coming out the John Woo white doves released in front of me in slow motion as i'm coming out with my head down and you know that's that's what i especially if you're a reliever to me that's the way to do opening up the bullpen door and then open up the yeah like that just in that slow motion with the doves coming out like that'd be legit i mean it's it's too much but it's somehow if you just (laughs) Is Did it, it these right? Days? Yeah, right. Is it? I mean, it's not like the NFL where you can't even do a celebration dance, the no fun league. I mean, come on, exactly. man. Like, I, yeah. I feel like it, a little theater, a little drama, as long as it's not the wave. Which, by the way, did you see Julia's uh, oh, asking yeah. the, all the players? I thought that was absolutely fantastic. If you guys haven't seen it, Julia uh, Morales mm-hmm. asked all the players if they liked the wave or didn't. And I, my favorite response was from... Jose Altuve, he was like, no speak of English. That's all he said. Yeah, and he just, yeah I'm not, not going to answer, so I'm walking like, away. I mean, that was the nah, most diplomatic response it's ever. The, it's the best response ever. But I thought that was pretty fascinating hearing what the players thought about it. But I, I think theater in, the, in, the, in sports, a little drama outside of the, the, you know, the game itself, as a, as a fan, as someone who grew up watching sports and loving it, there's something really wonderful about seeing players' personalities outside of just being a pitcher, just being a hitter, just being a defender. There's something great to see some of that come. And not obviously some people are more private and more quiet than others, and some guys are more flamboyant, and, and that's fine. But there is something to be able to hear what they think and see sort of how they behave in those circumstances and get their uh, personality out there. And I think, I think it's great, and I, I know fans love it. I certainly do. I didn't really think about it until you said it about the NFL, how the baseball's kind of ramped up the idea of yeah. bat flipping and, you know, uh, the K love struts it. that we see and things like that. You know, I, I, I love all of it when it's done appropriately. I don't yes. like it when it's 10 to nothing and you bat flip me and you just hit a solo home run, to make it 11 well, to nothing. I, or, or if you're, it's 11 to one, I'm like, okay, you know, that might be well, then you're just previous. being a dick really yeah. at that point, well, yeah, you know? Well, the part about being a dick is you're, it's like, look at me. And I like right. the fact when these guys, They bat flip, point to the dugout. It's all their boys all at once kind of celebrating, or it's the dugout celebrations, you know, because it's a team aspect to it. And I never, I mean, until you said it about the NFL, they've really kind of stripped down the idea of celebrating some big plays. You are playing at the elitist of elite levels of sport, and you can't enjoy success. That, that, That makes no sense. Well, I mean, the, the whole thing with that in celebrations of any kind really boils down to this idea of are you showing someone up or not? And I'm all of, I agree with you 100% that you, you do it at the appropriate time. But look, I'm going to go on record straight up as saying I loved it when guys would, like when Chad Johnson was in the league and like he would give CPR to the football or whatever after a touchdown. Weren't you like, kind of waiting in anticipation to so see what good. they were going to do next? It's so good and it's so yeah. and it's so much fun and and it really does I think what it does is it also brings fans closer to the game because maybe you can't catch a touchdown, maybe you can't hit a home run, but you certainly can celebrate. You certainly can, you know, uh know what it's like to feel joy for that moment. And if fans are, you know, and it's it's good to see how the players respond to that. No, and I think, you know, what we're trying to do in sport is encourage youth to play the sport that we are playing. And Great the point. greatest form Excellent of point. respect and it, it, as a kid was, I'm going to emulate Jeff Bagwell's swing. I'm going to try right. and be the next Gary Sheffield wagging the bat. Or I'm going to try and, like Hunter Brown looking at Justin Verlander. I want Dude, my delivery to look like right. that. Right. 
you know, so why wouldn't you, why would you discourage a kid to go, man, I want to celebrate like, you know, whoever it was that spiked that football, right. like Gronkowski or man, next time I score a touchdown in the street, I'm, I'm putting my cell phone underneath the car and I'm going to pull it out and, you know, and <laughs> no, answer it. And right. Go, you know, or, or at minimum, like at minimum do the electric slide. And, you know, I mean, yeah. there's that, you know, there's, it creates, it, it's the creativity it's fun. and enjoyment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun. Oh, and by the way, kudos to your production team for putting up that slow-mo comparison between oh, Hunter man. Brown's. How that was, was that? that was unbelievable. I actually, I actually froze it and got out my phone and recorded it so I could watch it <laughs> as remark, even his foot kick at the end. I was like, it's just unreal. Like, and by the way, he, yeah. keep doing whatever the year it is you're doing. <laughs> Obviously, that is working. So, if you want to, you know, yeah. mimicry is the most sincere form of flattery, and in this exactly. case, it's actually working. Yeah, no, that was amazing. Our truck does a very good job. You know, you bring up those things sometimes, or you try and, you know, looking at swings and and things yeah. like that. But to to know this backstory and see the delivery and yeah. then see it side by side, you just went, whoa, that was that was crazy, <clears throat> and it was really cool. They did a great job. And is there anything better than slow mo? Everything. I mean, honest no. to God, like there's nothing better than the hyper slow mo of a you know yep. like a bat hitting a ball or whatever. The more of that, the better. That's just there's just nothing better than that. Yeah. No. All right, Blummer. Well, thanks again. Thank everybody for listening. Uh, you can hear us on Spotify and on Apple and on all the normal places. Catch us on YouTube. We'll obviously be back next week talking more Astros and uh, you know just keep going at it. Find out who's going to be in the postseason with the Astros. Find out uh, what other names we can come up with for the Rangers besides Plano and South Oklahoma. Uh, maybe the Panhandle Rangers. Yeah. <laughs> anything Somewhere we can do. Texas, yeah. Anything we can do. Anything we can absolutely do. So thanks for joining us, and uh, go Astros.